The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Greetings, salutations. I'm going to do something a little different at the beginning of this one. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today. It is who the hell knows. It's Wednesday. I play this game at the beginning of every podcast. I, For a while, I was looking at the calendar before I went on air, and now I think it's more entertaining to just uh, guess when I start the show. What day is it? I know that... Um, there's a distinct possibility that I'm uh, in a, a deeper quarantine than most folks at this point, mostly because of our infant son and the lack of data on what this stuff, this this illness does to babies. Like, we have a lot of data on what it does to toddlers. They tend to be pretty safe. We have one of those. Um, and then some 30-somethings. I won't tell my wife's age on the podcast. I'm 37, and we're usually okay, but not always uh, there have been plenty of complications of folks in my age age group, but babies we just don't know. Like I feel pretty confident that I'd probably come out of it, come out the other side. Anyway, uh, for that reason, my life continues to be one very long day where sometimes it's light outside and sometimes it's not. And today uh, apparently is the part of my very long day that's called Wednesday. So hello Wednesday and hello everyone. I'm Dan Vespers. This is a hoop ball presentation. You can follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or head on over to hoop-ball.com to see what's going on over there. Pretty cool article by our buddy Adam King, who was on the show on Monday, that's called The Knights of the Round Table. The Knights of the Round Table! It's myself, Brew, Eric Ong, Josh Millman, Steve Vitovich, and Panda, and Adam, of course, breaking down some of the most polarizing players as we look way ahead towards next season. Pretty cool stuff, actually. Check that out. That's over at, at HoopBall, the main website, hoop-ball.com. Today is a relatively normal day. Again, at some point soon, we're going to go through some of the resumption numbers just to really parse those, pick them apart. But for now, we'll start the podcast by breaking down what's upcoming, the usual fare, what's coming up later on today. We've got Orlando, Milwaukee that starts just a shade after lunch here on the Pacific Coast. Oklahoma City and Houston, Game 2. And then Portland, without Damian Lillard, is uh, taking on the Lakers. Lakers are favored by a lot in that late game, which tells you all you need to know that Damian Lillard is worth like six points on the spread. That's a big deal. Who knows? He might see the Lakers let down a little bit. That's the big fear. Although, tough to argue that that's happening here in the playoffs. In any event, Milwaukee favored by 14. Orlando's given them some pretty good punches in this series, but ultimately, the last few games have all, at the end, kind of ended up the same way. Milwaukee won by 15 in the last ball game, uh, after winning by 14 in Game 3, after winning by 15 in Game 2, after losing by a bunch in Game 1. So that was your wake-up call. They lost by 12, and then they've barely beaten the spread in each of the next three victories. So that line sits at 14, which basically tells you this is probably about right. The only reason you might look at the Milwaukee side is, does Orlando finally throw in the towel at some point in this game? Do they finally look up at the scoreboard? They're down 16 or 17. And they're like, well, you know, we could really fight. We could really push at this point, And maybe we get it down to a, a single-digit deficit like we've done a couple of times. But is it worth it? Because, you know, we're smelling the end of the bubble adventure. Which, by the way, uh, we're going to have a segment today on Paul George. Because I had a segment yesterday on what he did that was weird. And we'll have a segment today on what he did that was awesome. You got to do both. You can do one, you got to do the other. And so when I think about... You know, Orlando looking at the exit from the bubble. I feel like they threw their punch most of Game 3. They were competitive. Milwaukee went on a big spurt early in the fourth quarter. That's what blew that ball game open. Total on this one is 227. Uh, totals have been very accurate. It was 227 in the last ball game, and it ended at 227. That was the final score, 121-106. When the line is tight like this, this is a perfect opportunity for in-game wagering. You wait for a team to go on a run. 
you make sure that whatever you're betting is based on what you're seeing, not the numbers in front of you, but what you can actually view happening on the court. Meaning, which team is getting the better shots? And if you go out have a stretch here where the team that's getting the worst shots, the lower percentage shots, suddenly rattles off three or four or five of them in a row, you can bet that by sort of staying the course, the better team is going to counterpunch. It's inevitable. That is the magic of numbers. Because watch the game. You know, Miami and Indiana, I think, was a perfect example of this. That was a pretty evenly matched series where Miami was getting shots throughout the series that were just ever so slightly better than the looks that Indiana was getting. It wasn't, it wasn't night and day. It wasn't like Toronto-Brooklyn, where the Raptors were getting way better looks throughout the entire series just because of a massive talent gap. It wasn't even really... Uh, Lakers Blazers, where you know the Lakers were generally getting better looks throughout the series, and it just took them a while to start to make a few. Uh, Miami and Indiana, it was it was subtle. It was more subtle. Indiana was working harder during their offensive sets. By the way, uh, there is news on the Indiana front, and I guess we'll we'll talk about that here in a moment. Th- just a working just a hair harder. Miami has Duncan Robinson coming off a screen, taking a three-pointer, slightly contested, but more or less in rhythm. Meanwhile, Malcolm Brogdon is sort of like dribbling into a three-pointer with the shot clock starting to wind down. One of those is a slightly better shot than the other. Duncan Robinson, I, you know, I don't have the metrics in front of me on what he shot on, you know, uh, pull-up threes around a screen on the right wing, but presumably it's a couple percentage points better than Brogdon on a walk-up three. Hypothetically, let's just say Brogdon shot 33% in those and Duncan Robinson shot 37%. Over in a one-shot sample, there's almost the exact same probability that they make it. But over 1,000, or even a a lower number than that, over 100, one of those guys is going to have, generally, about four more three-pointers than the other. That's 12 points. How many possessions are there in a basketball game? Usually close to 100. So it doesn't seem like much, but that one, two, three percentage point better look that one team is getting by the end of 48 minutes, by the end of 100 possessions is probably an easier way to think about it. They will just slowly pull ahead. But think about it this way, too. Over 100 possessions, we just said that's a 12 point difference in our hypothetical, meaning that it's just about a one point difference. Uh... Every ten, every 10 shots, or less than a point per possession. Make sure I'm getting this right. It's about a, about it's 12 one hundredths of a point per possession. If there are 100 possessions in a game, uh, that gives you about 25 and a quarter, roughly two per minute or so for each team. Roughly. I mean, this is we're doing a lot of rounding just to make the numbers easy to do on a podcast. Uh, but that gives you about 12 possessions in half a quarter, and that would be a difference. One team would then be beating the other after half a quarter of, uh, what is it, like a point and a half? Uh, it's a little bit more than that. Was it two? No, that's not right. Yeah, it's about, it's about, uh, it's about one and a half. It's about one and a half points per half quarter, three points per quarter. Well, how do you get to that point? How do you get to that mark? It's not like on every possession, it's not on every minute in the game, one team is a, you know, a tenth of a point ahead of the other. There are swings. Swings back and forth. Miami goes on a 12 nothing run. Indiana goes on an 11 nothing run. And at the end of those four or five minutes, or whatever it turns out to be, this hypothetical example, Miami is up one. But there is where the in-game wagering comes into play. If you're watching this game and you see, or you saw, because, you know, that series is over. But, again, for our hypothetical, I thought that one made a really good example. If you were watching those games and you saw what I saw, which is, I think, what most of us saw, which is, look, Miami's just getting slightly better shots. Both teams are playing hard. Both teams are defending. But Miami's looks are a couple percentage points better. Then when one team goes on an 11-0 run, the other team's going to have a run. 
It's the it's the law of large numbers and then the law of small sample sizes. Just because Indiana is getting shots that are a 44% clip of going in, they're going to make three or four of those in a row almost as often as Miami makes four or five in a row of a 46 or 47% look. I mean, it's why you can't just alternate red and black at a roulette table. There are certain odds of things happening, and over a short term, you're going to see these outliers. Four, five, six shots in a row is an outlier, but it happens. But when a team, when two teams are evenly matched, that outlier is often followed by one that balances the number. If a team is going to make 44 out of 100 shots over the course of an entire ball game, if they make six of them in a row, the other 38 are going to take longer to get to. So that's why I love in-game wagering for stuff like this. And this one, especially when you think the line is tight, uh, this one's not quite as simple. Milwaukee with a massive, massive edge. I think what you're probably looking for there is, you know, does Orlando have a little spurt at some point? It's a little bit different. You know, there's, there's more motivational stuff, the 3-1 series edge, et cetera, et cetera. Game two, Houston favored by 3.5 over OKC, total of 224.5. The Rockets have uh, petered out a little bit. Oklahoma City with some big contributions from Dennis Schroeder, able to come up with a win in the last two games in a row. That series now tied at two. OKC winning the last one, 117-114. to 114. Rockets hit a three-pointer at the buzzer. It was actually more of a six-point loss, but of course, you know, we're looking at that final number. That one went over the total, with the Rockets shooting 45% and the Thunder shooting 49%. And, of course, the big reason why the Thunder shot such a great percentage is that Dennis Schroeder hit 63% of his shots at a pretty good volume. He had 30 in that game. And I've got to believe that the Rockets are going to try to come up with something on the Schroeder front because he was getting past the initial defender, and that is a massive breakdown for a team that has no rim protection. There's none. Rockets have no rim protection. No one on that team is over six foot eight. Someone gets past the first man, they're going right to the rack. The Rockets' defense falls apart. They have to keep the ball in front of them, and I can I can bet you that that's going to be a point of emphasis in this ball game. Question is, do they pull it off? Can they actually do it? You know they're going to be focusing on it, but can they do it? You know, I still think that ultimately Houston's schemes are a better fit for this series. Uh, but right now, OKC has figured out a little hole in the Houston armor, and they're going after it with the one guy on their team that's fast enough to do so, and has the the sort of the fancy rim or around the rim work. Shea will get there, I think, at some point. He's not quite there yet, not quite tough enough around the rim, but he's on his way. Chris Paul, he's not going to be the finisher. He gets his mid rangers, and he's been extremely efficient with those. But that doesn't have, I mean, he can get that against any defense. The, the thing that's been, that changed the tide of this series was Dennis Schroeder getting ultra easy buckets, was breaking down the defense and opening things up for the other guys, even if he wasn't getting the shot himself, which he often was. I mean, Schroeder only had three assists in that ballgame. The Thunder as a team only had 16 assists. It's a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. That's what Houston wants you to do. They want minimal passing against them they switch everything so no one's ever fully unguarded but if you can beat your man the way Schroeder was you can get a look a good one because again no rim protection uh, I think Houston wins the ball game the fact that they're suddenly laying more than the last one was a, a tiny bit confusing a total of 224 and a half um, I, I mean I think you're starting to see lines that are tightening up a little bit so I would look, again, more at the in-game stuff. And Houston's perfect for in-game wagering because they go through dry spells and flurries like almost no one in the NBA when all of your shots are worth more points and at a lower percentage. The Lakers tend to be a team that doesn't have a ton of runs because a lot of their looks come right in front of the bucket. So, you know, they might go on a little spurt but because of their defense and because of their own shot selection, and you can watch who's on the floor. When LeBron is out, things change a little bit for L.A., but they're a team that shoots a really high field goal percent. They make, they're a tougher team to bet on runs against. 
Houston is a wonderful team to bet on runs. They might make four, five, three pointers in a row. Boom, boom, boom. 15 points in two minutes. And then they might miss. I mean, we saw it in the very last game. They made eight threes in a row to open the second half and then went something like three for 22 the rest of the way. And they still almost won it. But that's the, I mean, and it's not even a large number, but that's the law of large numbers. Those things always even out. If you thought Houston, when they went up by whatever it was, 14, 15 points early in that third quarter on the shoulders of that crazy three-point barrage, that was a wonderful time to get in on OKC. I happen to not be in front of my computer at the moment, but you just knew Houston wasn't going to shoot 100% from three. An effective field goal percent of 150? Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Yeah, three points per shot. I don't think that's going to keep up. So you knew at some point they were going to miss three, four, five threes in a row, and that's when OKC goes on their little eight or nine point spurt. Houston's wonderful for this stuff. I mean, it happens almost every game with that club. And then finally, Portland and L.A. I don't want anything to do with this ball game. Lakers a chance to close it out. LeBron, you know, he's smelling blood in the water, and he'll have the Lakers ready to go. In this is a regular season game. I would yell, let down, you know, uh, injured star theory in, until the uh, until I cried, until my ears bled, but not here. Having Dame out just makes Portland pedestrian. The Lakers don't really have to change much of what they do other than the fact that one guy on the floor now is going to be far, far less of a threat. I know Dame didn't have a particularly good game four. No one on the Blazers had a particularly good game four. I guess Nurkic was was fine. Um, but the Lakers can can just keep doing what they're doing. Forcing the Portland ball handling guards away from the rim, getting in their face so that they can't pull up for a an uncontested three at the three point line. If they're gonna do it, they're gonna have to be about four or five feet back. And then uh making it difficult, making the passing lane difficult to a rolling Nurkic on a lot of those screen and roll plays so that he has to catch the ball and kind of wait on the pass. That allows the Lakers to recover. Portland's best hope, I think, in this ballgame is running a bunch of off-ball off ball stuff, but we'll see if there's if, if they even have it in the tank. I, this is The series should be over today. Um, I don't want anything to do with this one, like I said. I, I think the Lakers win, but there could be this air of kind of uh, wreck ball at some point during it where the focus waxes and wanes. And so you might see the score go over if nobody's locked in on defense. Uh, uh, conversely, someone in the know might have a better feel on that. Like somebody that is around any of these teams in the bubble would know better than I would. How laser focused are the Lakers coming into a game with no Dame on the other side? If someone came to me and was like, I just talked to LeBron and... Like, his jaw hurts because he's been clenching and focused so hard. I'd be like, all right, well, they're probably going to beat the hell out of him. But I get this feeling, and especially with all of the uh, social justice... I'm trying to think of the right way to, to phrase it, but without going into a lot of the details, I know that the uh, the shooting of Blake has really reverberated strongly with the NBA players in the bubble and across the nation out in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I'm sure you guys have all read up on that. I've, I've, I've tried my best to um, not spend too much time on the pods on these types of things, but I know that this is, this is one that's hurting again. I mean, this is, this is the type of stuff that's actively being protested and continues to happen, so uh, rough go. And, and so, I, you know, in that vein, everyone in the bubble is a little bit distracted. I suppose that's as good a time as any, and I do want to mention our buddies over at MyBookie, but it's, it's as good a time as any to mention the fact that there are rumblings around the bubble that some players are thinking about leaving the bubble, that they they miss home, uh, that they, they want to go back to where they're from and, and work in the community immediately. The Raptors, there was talk of them potentially boycotting game one against the Celtics in their next round. It's not entirely clear that everything is going to continue as planned in the bubble. I I mean, I suppose we'll see. We'll see. A lot of these things feel... I mean, this is such a visceral topic that you just wonder if, you know, a couple days go by 
and a, a plan can be formulated, but, I, you know, we just don't know. We don't know. I'm on the outside of this. I'm on the outside of this. So we shall see. Um, assuming that things do go on as planned in the bubble, a quick recap on what happened in the two games on Tuesday night. But before we do that, I uh, do want to mention that all of the betting stuff we talk about, the lines, the sides, the totals, the in-game wagering, all that stuff is with our buddies over at mybookie.ag. I know a handful of you guys have signed up already, and I hope you're having a fun time. Minimum deposit is $45. Use the promo code HOOPBALL and get a deposit match promo unlocked. Unlock it with the HOOPBALL key. HOOPBALL word, that word is your key to unlock the 100% deposit match on your initial deposit when you make a new account and make that first deposit. So again, go to mybookie.ag, make a new account, drop in your first deposit. The third page of the sign-up window, third page is where you put in the promo code. So make sure you don't miss that. Uh, also makes us look great, and then you can have some fun with us. Our, our HoopBall gaming team is doing amazing things right now between baseball, basketball, and hockey, and soccer. It's fun to win money on sports you know nothing about. That's been my experience with Troy and soccer over there. They're, those guys are just, they're, they're doing a wonderful job, uh, and I believe there should be a, a Today in Sports Betting pod coming out here in the not-too-distant future. Uh, our other partners here on the Fantasy NBA Today podcast are uh, our buddies over at Manscaped.com. The coupon code there is HoopBall20. You can get the lawnmower 3.0 revved up for the year 2020. The lawnmower 3.0 took them a year and a half to get the upgrades right on the 2.0. This one with the built-in LED and waterproof technology. Pretty damn good. Check it. HoopBall20. 20% off free shipping at Manscaped.com. Or just go get some of their swag. Boxers, shaving mats. They've got other things like razors and nose and ear t- hair trimmers. And I mean, it's really just, it's male grooming. I know that their shtick is to talk about below-the-belt grooming, but they've got all the grooming stuff. Which, to me, honestly, I know that like one way of promoting it is the funny way. But they've got a lot of things, so check them out. It doesn't have to be about below-the-belt. Tuesday night's results, Denver... Even did no, they didn't. They they're down three to two, but they did fight like the Dickens. Jamal Murray went big for the second time late in uh, third time, I think, late in this series. Actually, he's having a really good series against the Jazz. Jamal had forty two eight and eight, and was extremely efficient with them. Uh, they it used to be as he goes, so go the Nuggets. But right now, their defense has been tough, and um. It went over again, which is what we were talking about yesterday. I like looking at this thing going, I don't like you just keep doing the same thing until somebody proves to you that something else is going to happen. The pace was a tiny bit slower in this game, but both teams shot 50%. Nuggets actually shot 51%. Not a ton of free throws. So you actually could have had more points piled up at the foul line. Um, Decent number of turnovers on the Jazz side, or they might have even won this game. Jokic was good. Michael Porter Jr. had some points. Jeremy Grant is sort of revealing himself to be a starter-level player next year on the Nugs. Um, And then Paul Millsap is more or less on his way out. Gary Harris was questionable. He ended up not playing. Thought he might play. Thought he might give him a little energy kick, but uh, not to be. Over on the other side, Joe Ingles. Aggressive Joe Ingles is fun, Joe Ingles. Royce O'Neal was good again. Conley, Donovan Mitchell, the usual fair. Uh, Jordan Clarkson. I mean, they're just, like, they still shot 50%, but they lost. So the, the shootout continues. And I, I'll probably do the same thing in the next one until one of these games goes under. I don't know how you, you go the other direction. Meanwhile, in the nightcap, things got ugly quick. Clippers beat the Mavs 154 to 111, they shot 63% for the ball game the Clippers did. You have to look real hard to find anyone on the Clips who shot sub-50%. In fact, the only two players who did, Amir Coffey, uh, which is also the way you describe one very small cup of joe. All I'm stuck with here is Amir Coffey and Jamichael Green. Both of those guys went 0 for 1. 0 for 1! Every other player on the Clippers shot 50% or better on three shots or more. And if you're Evita Zubats, you went two for two. Paul George, 12 for 18. Montrezl Harrell, six for 11. 
Uh, Kawhi Leonard, what the hell is that? 12 for 19? I'm looking at the percent. Somehow Kawhi missed a bunch of free throws. That was pretty weird. But, yeah, they just they just annihilated the Mavs' defense. And uh, it's one very obvious reason why. And it wasn't Pat Beverly, because that was what we were talking about yesterday. It was like, look, if Pat Beverly plays, maybe they wake up a little bit. Instead, it was Paul George that woke him up. And I don't really care much about what's going on on the Mavs' side. Um you know, Luka Doncic didn't seem quite right in this ball game. Couldn't hit his free throws, couldn't hit his shots, had five turnovers. Did the Clippers change what they did? Maybe a little bit. Was it just a bad game? Do they need Porzingis in there? I mean, all of these things are probably a soft yes, but ultimately, you're not going to win a game if you give up 154 points. So we should probably focus on that. Um, but really, the story in this game and now this series is Paul George, who after the game talked about the fact that the bubble had basically given him depression. He was feeling isolated. He was feeling depressed. He was feeling confused. He said, I think his line was the bubble got to me. He spoke to a psychiatrist, uh, presumably about all of the stuff that he was dealing with mentally in the bubble. And he came out a renewed man. I think he even said that he checked out. He was checked out, which you could see he was checked out. He wasn't taking shots. He was just wasn't engaged. It was weird. And so, for all the things that I said yesterday, I still believe they're true. I don't like the way he left Oklahoma City. I think it was messed up. I think he it blew up a whole franchise that had planned around him being there for at least another two years, then, you know, expiring deal. Like, I get it. Teams move guys on expiring contracts all the time, usually with a half a year left or one year left or whatever it is. It's just weird to sign a four-year deal and then ask out after one when the team has Russell Westbrook and is has the championship aspirant. Well, whatever. All of that stuff I still believe is true, but I think it's important that we give him the credit he deserves for being so forthright with what he was going through. This is the kind of stuff that makes it easier for other people to talk about the things they're going through. There shouldn't be a stigma attached to feeling depressed, to feeling anxiety. Even just feeling down, if you got the blues... I know there, there's different thresholds, different levels for all of this stuff. I don't know that I've ever been truly depressed in my life where, you know, nothing, you can't sort of logic your way out of it. But that, it sounds like, is what Paul George was going through. Um, whoever this guy, psychiatrist was, kudos, and certainly kudos to Paul for going and seeking out someone to talk to to discuss what he was dealing with inside of his head. Because he came out in this one, he was aggressive, he was focused, he made all seven of his free throws, went 12 for 18, 35 points on 18 shots in only 25 minutes. If he's awake, the Clippers go back to being the team that I laid money on to win the finals. (laughs) That's a big big difference. When they aren't guarding anybody and just say, Kawhi, you go ahead and you try to do this. But now they go back to having two of the best wing defenders in the NBA, if not the two best, on the same team. And so, I mean, this is what I thought might happen. Not 45 points, but remember when this series started, I had the Clippers in five because I thought they'd just throw waves of Paul George's and Kawhi Leonard's at Luka Doncic and slow down the one thing that can make the Mavs go. And they finally did. So big ups to Paul George for talking about this. I'm sure that other folks in the bubble are going through the same or similar things, especially now, especially now with uh, racial injustice and police brutality coming back into the forefront. Not that it ever really didn't, wasn't in the forefront, uh, but with the the shooting of Jacob Blake, uh, it is very much in the spotlight. I, I haven't decided when we're going to talk about the blah, 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 the the resumption stuff. I don't know. We'll, we'll slot it in at some point. What's the rush, right? We got these fun playoff games to watch. Um, and really, at this point, you know, we're, we're co- sort of hanging in the balance here, just uh, trying to make sure that the NBA continues. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. If it does, it does. I just, you know, I love watching these playoff games. It's... For me, uh, selfishly, this is the most excited I've been about a playoffs in a really long time because it had that big separation 
between regular season and postseason. And yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, talking about the eight game sprint here as regular season games, but if that's what needs to happen, then that's what happens. I think just as someone who pays very close attention to how the media handles things and calling the, you know, this one massive orb, the media is already doing it a disservice, but just bear with me for a moment here. The media, however you want to determine what they are, they play a colossal role in moving causes like this forward. Money and awareness. The problem is, the media makes their money from advertisers. From advertisers. And they get the money from the advertisers by having a lot of viewers. And so, if you're a media company, you can't cover the same thing for too long or you will lose viewers. This is a really, I mean, this is a, a sort of dark and, and uh, I, I don't, listen, I, I hope that this is not coming off as me saying that something shouldn't be covered 24-7. I felt that as though the coverage of coronavirus was, you know, 24-7 for a while and then the coverage of the protests was 24-7 for a while, but nothing gets covered forever in that same way. And so if you want any cause or any story, this doesn't even have to be about what's going on right now, if you want any story to be advanced, if you want a cause to be advanced, you have to keep coming up with new ways to draw attention to it. I don't know what those are. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer on that front. But I do know that that's the way you get everyone paying attention over and over again. And it sucks that that's what you have to do to get to point B here from point A. That getting to point B in this particular case isn't as simple as just, yeah, this should be done because it's the right thing to do, which, you know, clearly it should be. We should all be treated equally. We're not. But to get to point B, to get to the point where a politician makes a move on something, there needs to be continuing pressure and awareness and coverage is a big part of that. So hopefully they come up with something. Uh, I mean, again, selfishly, I hope they come up with something that allows the playoffs to continue. If they don't, then I will obviously understand. Uh, but I think, it, you know, we got to get creative. They got to get creative. Again, more than just, you know, words on a court, words on a jersey. Come up with something else that's going to get everybody's attention. And that's how you do it. I don't know that going home is the answer. It might be, but I don't know that. I, I don't know that it is. I'm not sure that that's going to boost the coverage of something. And then you get into the dichotomy of, you know, whether or not it's just a, it's just a matter of comfort. So, I, you know, listen, I'm venturing into waters that, uh, that I, I can't fully explain or understand because of my own background, but that's where we are with this. So hopefully, fingers crossed, um, that we can get, have our cake and eat it too. Playoff basketball and social progress. Is that so much to ask for? Have a wonderful Wednesday, everybody. This is Fantasy NBA Today. I am Dan Vesperus, at Dan Vesperus on Twitter. You know, hoop ball presentation, all that good stuff. Big thank you once again to mybookie.ag and manscaped.com. Um, and, you know, keep doing the right thing out there, folks. Help raise awareness. Do what you got to do, uh, and we'll figure out a way through it. Let's see what happens. Talk to you tomorrow, everybody. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.